would like to say thanks for the organizers to invite me to speak in this lecture, in this section, in this lecture. So I will talk a little bit about uh, solid state anymore. I will give some examples. How can, could you use this uh, tool to get information concerning in structure? And so just uh, I introduce myself. So I'm working at the University Federal of Rio de Janeiro. And I, I'm working with uh, several projects. So membrane protein, um, so like membrane fusion protein involved in the entrance of Ebola virus into the cells. Um, M protein involved in dengue virus um, entering into the cells. And some ionic pore proteins um, like uh, P2X7 receptor that is a collaboration with a group in uh, one institution in Brazil. I have several projects in collaboration with uh, Germany, um, with heart muscinat that belongs to the Leibniz for molecular pharmacology. Um, I'm working with RR01, called it cryopeptide. It's one project that I talked today. And Estefine Beta, that is a collaboration with uh, Hartmut and a group belonging to uh, Schenfeld University. And I have some projects in collaboration with people from my university. I'm working with prion protein, uh, studying the misfolding uh, linked to the binding to DNA and RNA and carbohydrates. And I'm also um, using as a model uh, TTR proteins like a monomer and also like a tetramer to try to figure out what is happening during the misfolding pathway. And now I'm also working with in-cell NMR to try to solve some um, problems concerning protein misfolding. So I show you up just a few slides concerning my um, one structure that I solved. So the reason to, to show you that is like uh, sometimes we have huge uh, complexes and we needed to decrease the, complexi uh, the complexity to, to get more information. So in the case of Ebola virus, I was using only a small peptide that is involved to membrane interaction. And we published these two papers, and in this one, I saw the structure by solution anymore. And in this one, I was proposing a new model to the entrance of virus into the cells. So Ebola is a pleomorphic virus, and we have two proteins linked to the entrance of the virus into the cells. This is the protein responsible for the receptor binding, and GP2 is responsible for the membrane fusion. I was using just a small peptide cons uh, consisting of 16 residues in length. And the structure showed us like a region well folded. And this region was proposed by us that is responsible for the binding to membrane. And we were using um, several techniques to uh, change the amino acid, uh, like tryptophan, to try to figure out what is happening. Uh, so like the stability was created by uh, the, proximi the proximity between uh, tryptophan and phenylalanine, or there is no reason for that. So this is not the reason for that. So we observed like when we uh, changed like the tryptophan for alanine, we lost the, 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 protein st the peptide stability. So probably um, the tryptophan and phenylalanine interaction is important. So this is the region that uh, we were believing to be the response for the interaction with membrane. So here we have two kind of liposomes. Here is uh, a liposome composed of four uh, different kind of lipids. And here is lipid raft that I extracted from cells. So we observed like the peptide can bind to both of them. And the region responsible for that is this region. The same region that we were believing based on several data uh, like uh, fluorescence and uh, molecular dynamics. So here is one molecular dynamics using um, my cells, SDS my cells. That was the same uh, mimetic environment that we were using to solve this structure. So our data were, in, were um, all data were like uh, pointing to the same direction. That was really good. And last year, we proposed a new entrance of the virus into the cells. So 
the virus is binding to uh, a region called like lipid rafts and can be um, can go inside the cells by endocytosis and the peptide can bind into this membrane and promote diffusion delivering to the cytoplasm the virus RNA. So this paper was well accepted and so the people are um, making several citations about this. But today I will talk uh, about amyloidosis. And in this picture, we can observe several kinds of disease. Each disease is associated to one protein. But we can follow them and we can observe that we have more or less the same behavior. And we can observe like proteins aggregating in these tissues. So the another uh, feature that is common to all of them is that we can observe like fibrils or amorphous aggregates if you take one uh, electron microscopy. Seems quite similar, but if you have a look into an uh, atomic level, you can observe some difference between them. So sometimes people used to make comparisons only based on um, electron microscopy and some thioflavin um, binding, but uh, it's extremely important to see really deep the interaction between uh, amino acid by amino acid to see how different they are. So in general, we need to use a different approach to get more information concerning our system. So electron microscopy is extremely important because you can have the idea how it organizes your system. So like we have fibrils, we have amorphous aggregates, what we have. And using X-ray diffraction, so you can observe some distance concerning fibrils topology. So the combination of these two techniques is extremely important to put it together with NMR data. So here we have solid state NMR. Uh, with some uh, constraints that you can obtain from this technique, you can get a model or you can get a structure. It will be dependent on the, the, the quality of your data, how many constraints do you have per residue. So this paper is quite interesting. So in 2010, this group published this paper that is concerning several kind of um, X-ray diffraction map because up to this time, all diffraction map were quite uh, similar. And the people were believing, okay, you have a better cross structure and all of them are quite similar. And several people were um, showing several diffraction maps that were pointing, pointing out that the structure sh should be different. So you can follow the diffraction map and you can have some idea about the, uh, the secondary structure topology. But my question is, are amyloid-like fibrils always pathological? So we need to take care because in some cases, some organisms use this kind of approach like uh, it's healthy, it's not uh, dangerous for these organisms. So like uh, this kind of prion here. But why do we use solid state anymore? So we have solution state anymore. So the reason for that is, in principle, is the limit. Of course, we can get several uh, results from this, but the number of people working with solid state increased because of the limitation of two important high resolution techniques. So X-ray crystallography. If you wanna use X-ray, you need to have a crystal. Sometimes you can spend two years, five years to get a crystal. And if you have a crystal, this crystal could provide you good diffraction. And sometimes you don't have a good resolution. And this is a problem. If you're thinking about membrane protein, you have an amphipathic system. So you need to have a crystal that can fulfill this kind of behavior. And to have two phases is too complicated. And sometimes you can't get a good crystal with a good diffraction. If we're talking about solution state anymore, we need to think about the molecular wave. So if you are working with small peptide, protein, small proteins, it's fine. 
you can get a good structure really fast. But if you increase the size, you will, be, you will um, become the relaxation of this, the tumbling of this sample will slow down. And so you will have a problem with a short tissue that will increase the line broadening. This is a problem because your resolution will decrease and it will become complicated to get structures. So if you are talking about huge uh, complexes, it will be really complicated to use solution state anymore. In this way, we have solid state anymore. So here's a picture. Um, the, the rotor is the place that we use to put the sample inside. We have several sizes. And the size are directly correlated with the maximum uh, spin speed that we can use. So seven millimeter is this one. We can uh, spin um, like eight kilohertz, no more than that. Otherwise, you can crash your tube. And we have this, the smallest is this one, is 1.3 millimeter. You can like uh, go faster like uh, 17. Uh, 70 kilohertz. This is quite interesting. So in, the, in our center, we are going to buy a new machine, a 700, and a probe that we can use 1.3 millimeter uh, rotors. So what's the difference, the basic difference between solution and solid state? In solution, the tumbling of the sample is really fast because the, 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 the molecule is small. So if I have that, so I can average the uh, chemical shift and isotropy to zero in a time that we can use for NMR. That's great. And I can also remove the heteronuclear and homonuclear dipolar coupling, the average. And this is what I want to do when I'm using magic angle spinning. So there are two types of solid states, not only this one. You can use static too. In general, the people use to, the group of Opella is using to solve some questions concerning membrane proteins. But uh, in my case, I'm using um, magic angle spinning. So our idea is to use this magic angle spinning to, uh, to to, to have the same behavior than one sample in solution. So we will try to remove the chemical shift and isotropy effects and assist in the removal of heteronuclear dipolar coupling. I'm not talking here in homonuclear because it's really huge, but we can observe like we can decrease this effect too. So here we have uh, the principle of this approach. So here we have the external magnetic field that could be, I don't know, um, you can use like 500 megahertz, what you need. And so, and we have the rotor here. And here we have the uh, shoot tensor. That could be the uh, chemical shift and isotropy or the pole uh, tensor. Nine point um, seven, I think. Nine point seven, Tesla. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, you can use this rotor in the, at this position, and you have the uh, shield tensor here. And this is the principal axis of this tensor. So, of course, we have this is the orientation of this um, this spin, and this is the average, and it will be directly related to the orientation that is related to this angle that can, if you have a pounder, you can adopt several angles, different angles. But if you are rotating, the average, it goes to zero. It goes to one, a, a fixed number, I mean. So, and beta also. So in a pounder, you can adopt several angles, but uh, if you are rotating, you get a fixed angle. So in principle, if you put your sample and in, relation, in relation to the spinning axis, in relation to the external magnetic field, like the magic angle that is 54.7 degrees, so three coseno squared 
this angle minus one will become zero. So this will become zero. This means like uh, the average of orientation of spin will get to zero. So this means if you rotate your sample really fast, you can decrease the chemical shift anisotropy, the average could be zero. So you have the same behavior than a sample in solution. Also the polar to polar interaction. So this is the, um, the behavior that we can expect. So a uh, slow spinning speed, the average is not so fast. It's not going there so fast. So it will, will not be perfect. If you increase the spinning speed, you become really, really good, and you can get like a good um, chemical shift to anisotropy going to zero and dipolar dipolar interaction too. So our idea in this case is um, increase the spinning speed as more we can. And the reason for that, so like we have homonuclear and heteronuclear um, dipolar coupling. So here we have the external um, field. And here we have one spin i and one spin j. And we have the angle between them. So the distance between them is extremely important because it will be related to the dipolar, dipolar interaction. So that we have also important is the gamma. So how magnetic is, are these two spins? So in this case, if you think about the homonuclear coupling spin pairs, so it will be extremely important, the, this angle. So if we put this angle in the magic angle, you become this close to the average in the time that we are measuring. So will be zero. And we can decrease this approach. So this is one example. For instance, if you have this, um, the spinning speed like zero, it's not rotating anymore. And you have the line width for your spectrum like um, this size, this line width, you will still like this. But if now you increase the spinning speed, and, but this spinning speed is still smaller than this line width, we will not have any effect. You need it to increase even more in general, we need to increase approximately four times to get a good uh, effect. But if you increase in this time, so you have like uh, some side bands. But if now you have a spinning speed really uh, faster than the size of this line width, you get a very narrow peak. This is our goal, so we needed to have this resolution. And this is what we have in isotropic sample in the case of uh, solution state anymore. So this uh, works like uh, we, we are trying to make a mimetic environment to, to use like a solid samples uh, using like a solution. So this is a very nice comparison. So here we have a static sample when you increase it to 400 hertz, we have um, so like a sharp lines going, uh, going up. And so like uh, when you increase it to four kilohertz, the, the, the line is narrow. And of course, if you compare with solution, it's not so nice, but it's still like uh, quite interesting. So what's the difference um, between solution and solid state? Here I have just a few uh, ways to compare. Um, so like uh, in solution, we have an isotropic environment. In solids, we have an isotropic environment. This is the reason to have like a chemical shift and isotropy and dipolar to polar interaction uh, uh, effects interfering with our uh, result. We have in solution proton acquisition. That is quite nice because we have 99.9% of proton in our uh, amino acids and our proteins. That's quite interesting. This is a good natural abundance. And in solids, we needed to use like a carbon-13. 
that is not so magnetic as proton, and the sensitivity is really low in comparison to proton. So for instance, one experiment that I can use um, 30 minutes using proton acquisition, maybe I can use 24 hours um, using carbons. Um, the, the lines are uh, really narrow in, the, in relation to solution, but is a bit broad in relation to solid state. And you can work with homogeneous system using solution and inhomogeneous system. Of course, the resolution will be dependent on the heterogeneity of your system. So in solution, you can use scalar coupling, and in solids, you can use dipolar coupling. So basically, we use dipolar coupling in almost all experiments, but we can use also scalar coupling. Sorry, here I have a mistake. <laughs> so we use basically uh, cross polarization in almost all experiments using solid state. Why we use that? I told you like the proton has 99% of abundance in our uh, samples. So it's quite interesting to use this nuclei to, uh, to polarize and transfer the magnetization to another nuclei, less sensitive. So this could be, for instance, carbon. And so you apply a 90 uh, degree pulse, you can transfer the magnetization to uh, x, y uh, axis. And in this way, you can make like a, a spin lock on proton, and I show you what will happen, but you can transfer the magnetization to carbon, and you can do everything that you want now with carbon. So in this case here, we are acquiring data. So this uh, step is what we called a Hartmann condition. So you will try to put both of them in the same uh, precession, the same Larmor frequency. So here is only one example of how could you set this experiment. So we have several uh, bands, and you can follow this, and you can decide the best uh, value. So how this works? So in principle, you have the magnetization in zeta x, and you apply a 90 pulse, um, so in proton, and later you will apply the uh, cross polarization. When you apply the cross polarization, in basically you have your uh, magnetization in x axis. And you are keeping the magnetization on this axis, and you will create a new field. And so when you're thinking about uh, Larmor frequency, you are thinking about the external uh, uh, field. But in this case, when you are using spin lock, you create uh, another field that now uh, you will use. So um, in this case, you have, for instance, when you have uh, a Lamour frequency, uh, so like a Zeeman's effect, like for proton, in a 500 megahertz field, you have this kind of behavior. For instance, this is for another nuclei. For instance, I don't know, carbon. And you have uh, this kind of uh, Zeeman uh, effect. So what will happen if you have two nuclei um, processing in different frequencies, you, you cannot connect both of them. You need to have they at the same frequency. What we need to do is, for instance, here is one example of different frequencies, like a six, uh, 600 megahertz and 150 megahertz. This is for a field of uh, 600 megahertz for proton. In this case, you cannot, this is not the Hartmann condition. You need it to fulfill uh, in a way that you can have both of them processing at the same frequency. Only during the spin lock. So, and here is during the, the spin lock. So, you have now this processing to 50 kilohertz and this one also to 50 kilohertz. And now you can have the Hartmann condition. That could be one, twice, or three times. 
And here is only the, uh, when you have the way that you can transfer the magnetization from proton to carbon. To get this condition is really easy, it's not too complicated. You can increase the sensitivity applying a spin echo in your sequence, but uh, it's still okay. But I told you when we are applying uh, a magic angle spinning, we are uh, averaging the dipolar coupling to zero. But uh, this uh, parameter is extremely important because you can have the distance between two spins. Uh, if you think about uh, how I know that I am here, it's because I have a reference in relation to him and in relation to him. So this is the same in protein folding. If I have a structure, I know the position of a beta helix or an alpha helix, oh, sh sorry, a beta sheet or a alpha, alpha helix because of the position of each uh, spin system. So this is what I will try to get back, is the, uh, is the information concerning the distance between two spins. So for that, I needed to make the dipolar recoupling. I need at the, the time that I want to, to, keep to, to get back the information concerning the pole, pole interaction. So we have several homonuclear uh, dipolar recoupling, like rotational resonance. This will happen every, uh, rotate, uh, every um, whole rotation of the rotor. For instance, every, if I'm using MAS like five, uh, kilohertz, every five kilohertz, I have one rotational uh, resonance. So this is quite interesting because I can follow if my system is working nice, because if I have, for instance, in my spectrum, like f six kilohertz, but in my machine is like, f was set to five, I know that the spinning speed is not going well. And I need to fix it. So I can use drama and I can use RFDR. Basically, we have one sequence that is like, uh, you need to apply several 118 uh, degree pulses to make the recoupling. And the heter heteronuclear uh, dipolar recoupling, I can use like a reader, for instance, to measure distance between nitrogen and carbon, and TIDOR, that is twice <coughs> reader, to make the same measurements. So here I have uh, a very nice uh, uh, approach published by Jaronik, Christoph Jaronik, that is a pretty young professor in Ohio. And this experiment is extremely important because it was possible to solve like uh, the question concerning distance between nitrogen and carbon in a uniformly labeled sample. In principle, it was only possible to use two spin systems and now it could use uh, in a uniformly labeled sample. And another thing that is extremely important, so in this uh, experiment we have a 90 degree pulse and we have a cross polarization here and we have a train of pulses, 180 degree pulses to make the transfer of energy between carbon and nitrogen. So we can control this in our experiment. And the nice thing is this delay here that is extremely important because we have one behavior when you have like a two uh, spin close to each other, you have a very strong polar coupling. But it, if they are really far from each other, you have a very weak. And the, the extent of this uh, dipolar coupling could be in the same range than scalar coupling and you can have the problem of scalar coupling in your spectrum. And to solve this problem, uh, Christoph uh, introduced these delays here that were quite interesting because it was possible. You can see here in red is because this artifact is because of the scalar coupling. And applying this uh, pulse sequence, we decreased uh, this, uh, these artifacts. So this is quite nice because here we have a small peptide, but in general we have huge molecules. And so you can imagine how crowded will be the spectrum. And with this artifact could be really worse. And using RFDR, RFDR um, is well described by uh, the group of 
uh, Robert Griffin from MIT. And uh, it's quite interesting. You can introduce this pulse sequence in almost all sequence. In general, what you, you can do is like you can change the sequence based on what you want. Of course, you need to take care, but you can do that. And RFDR is quite interesting. This is a homonuclear dipolar recoupling. Here is one data that I had. You can observe like the, the peaks are really sharp. And this is quite interesting. My sample is a bit, uh, is not a, a really common sample. So we have several approaches to label sample. Uh, it's a bit complicated to work with it's, uh, huge complexes. So in general, we needed to decrease the degree of complexity. And for that, uh, the group of Hartmus Kinat developed a new strategy to label samples. And this is using 2-glycerol during the, the protein labeling and 1-3-glycerol. So 2-glycerol are in red and 1-3-glycerol is in green. So here is a uniform labeled sample. You can observe several peaks. This is for alpha spectrin SH3 domain. And if you, now we are using 2-glycerol, you can observe less peaks. This is quite interesting because you can observe like the, the, the profile is completely different for each amino acid. So you can identify really better in this spectrum the amino acids. But if you are using 1-3-glycerol, you can observe also better here. You can have more uh, peaks. But there is another thing that this kind of labeling can help us. In principle, when you have, for instance, three spins, A, B, and C, A and B are really strongly uh, coupled, and you have A and B weakly uh, coupled, and C and B really, uh, weakly coupled, you have a problem that we, we call truncation. You cannot observe weak coupling. And do you miss some details in your spectrum? So when you uh, decrease the level of labeling, you are decreasing the amount of uh, strong dipolar-dipolar uh, coupling. And now you can observe more weak couplings. So this was the, the first structure solved by Solid State and more. It was published in 2002. We don't have a lot of structures already published. We have much, much less than in solution. We have another strategy. For instance, in the case of fibrils. Fibrils, we have, um, for instance, two monomers binding to each other. And how, I, how could I know the structure of one and the other and the interaction between them? So I needed to discriminate between intra and intermolecular connectivities. So I could do that using like uh, different kind of uh, labelings. For instance, I can use um, one monomer labeled with nitrogen and the second labeled with carbons. So if I have the connection between them, I can observe the, uh, the cross peak. So here is one sample uh, uniformly labeled. I have one experiment like that. I have proton. I have the magnetization proton that will be transferred to <coughs> nitrogen. I can have a mixing. So like I can transfer the magnetization to proton and from proton link it to nitrogen to proton link it to carbon. And then I will transfer to carbon by the second cross polarization. And I can measure this. Of course, you lose magnetization during this process because you have several CPs. And in general, if you are applying, for instance, one specific CP that you have like a shaped pulse, and you can like uh, lose approximately 30% of your magnetization. But in this case, we'll, you have several CPs during the way. And in general, it's not like in solution that you can use, for instance, 100 milliseconds as mixing time during like a, the transfer of magnetization proton-proton. Here you use like a 150 microseconds. So this experiment is quite nice because you can follow and you can see like a hydrogen bounds and so on. 
So here we have uniform labeled samples, and here is another approach because here you don't know if you are observing like uh, intra or intermolecular coupling, uh, connections. But here, in a diluted sample, like uh, you can use one one like uh, labeled with nitrogen and labeled with carbons. And now you are observing only intermolecular connectivities. That's quite nice because now you know exactly what you are observing. So in principle, to solve the structure, you need to get like uh, intra-residual connectivities, inter-residual connectivities. Mm -hmm. This you can do like applying a carbon-carbon correlation. You can go to a second level. You can have like inter-sheet constraints, inter-strand constraints, long-range connectivities, and you can use several labeling approaches to get there. The final level, I'd say, is the calculation. You can spend a lot of time during this, this period. So we have several softwares being developed. I used to use ARIA, that you have a platform connected to CCPN, that you can like, work together and get the structure. Or, of course, you can get the model. You'll be dependent on your data. So, in general, when you are talking about fibrils, you have some, for instance, the core used to be really stable, but the region out of the core used to be really flexible. You can probe that using solid state. For instance, um, in this case, I was using inept, that is based on scalar coupling, so through bound, and I observed like a really sharp lines. So the signal to noise was not so good because I was not using a lot of scans, but still I have mobility in my fibrils. And when I was applying cross polarization together MAS, magic angle spinning, that is based on dipolar coupling through space. So I observed like a, a good spectrum, but not uh, well uh, resolved like uh, the inept but I know that I have reached the regions. So using CPMAS, you can uh, filter out so like a mobile parts, or if you are using very short uh, contact time, you can, uh, you can probe these mobile regions too. You need to take care. So if you are applying direct excitation, so you can excite directly on carbon, so you can see both of them. That is this one. So in principle, I have here a good signal to noise only because I'm using the polar coupling. I have a difference in the factor of 10 in relation to scalar to, um, to the polar coupling. So I have a sensitivity higher when I'm using uh, the polar coupling. And of course, here I make the coupling too, and this is the reason to have um, well uh, dispersed uh, peaks. So if I'm talking about protein mobility, probably I use inept, that is scalar coupling based. So here's just one sequence, really simple. This is a reversed inept. So you can control what you wanna see. Here is just one um, <coughs> spectra uh, in which you have the different groups and you know exactly how, uh, the frequency that you need to use to get there. But, uh, so you only need to know exactly the point that you want to see and put in these delays here. So you can observe here that CH3 has a phase opposite to CH2. If I'm using this, um, this time, I can probe both of them at the same time. This is one example. So for instance, in the, blue, the, the dark blue, I have, um, uh, I'm probing CH, CH2 and CH3, so I can see all of them. But if I'm dopped, I can use that approach and I can only probe like a CH3 or CH2 groups and I can solve this problem. So this is it's nice to use the reversed. Um, it's a bit different if you take a look in the literature. We have these 180 pulse here. This is only to, to decrease the scalar coupling. We can use like a composite pulse too. 
So this sample, this is uh, one amyloid fibrils. This was impressive because in general, you cannot use like a proton acquisition for that. And in this case, we have um, several uh, spinning speeds, like a 250 uh, kilohertz, 6,000 uh, hertz, 12.5 kilohertz, and you are observing like a sharp lines. The line width if is comparable to solution anymore. This means that this, um, this flexible part in these fibrils is really, really flexible. So this uh, proposed us to start to use some sequence that the people use to apply for solution. And so this is the HC, HSQC, a normal uh, experiment that the people can run using solution. And the spectrum was really good. We did proton acquisition. So like it took me uh, 30 minutes, uh, two hours to get this uh, spectrum. The last one that I showed you before, 24 hours to each one. So like 48 hours for all of them. So I can get uh, more results in less time if I'm using proton acquisition. So another uh, possibility um, that I will show you today is like concerning um, coiled coil peptide. So this peptide is quite interesting. So it seems really easy to work with it, but it's not like easy. So it has like a 24 residues in length, but the problem is the repetition. So how could I know if I'm talking about these residues or these residues? They are similar. And what I did was to see which regions I have in my sequence that are different that I could go like uh, the first step. So what I did in principle, I received, this is a collaboration with uh, some professors in university, uh, Free University in Berlin. And uh, I received this model, and I was working to see if the model that the people were, were proposing were right. And uh, what I did, I was labeling some amino acids. In principle, I was checking like uh, the features uh, of this peptide, so some uh, charged amino acid that is expected to acquire to coil peptide, and a hydrophobic core. So the structure is fitting pretty well and is also fitting with several data from this group. But we were not sure about the model. And so I labeled in a first moment the valine tree and leucine 15 and valine 14 to see the, the interaction between valine tree and leucine 15. So the experiment that I was using was a PDSD that is uh, just like a, a 90 pulson proton magnetization being transferred to proton to carbon, a mixing step in which I can observe carbon interaction with carbons close to each other. So I can have like a spectrum with several uh, connections between carbons. And here, I have uh, a NCA and NCO uh, experiment in which I have also 90 degree pulse on proton. I can transfer the magnetization from proton to nitrogen. So I can uh, have a first delay here and I can transfer the magnetization to uh, by a specific cross polarization because of the efficiency and from nitrogen to carbon and I can measure the uh, the second delay here. So this is quite important because I can use a, like, uh, I can put my offset on carbon alpha or a carbon nail and I can know the, the neighbor that I have. So I can make the assignment. So here we have the first uh, result and it was not, so I observed like the neighbors, but I didn't observe the connection between valine tree and leucine 15. Maybe the model was wrong, 
but I was not completely sure. I, I was preparing another peptide, but now I was labeling um, like leucine 5 and valine uh, 14. I was keeping valine 3 labeled to, to be sure that I was preparing the same kind of fibros to avoid because fibros is a complicated system to work because we have several polymorphism and I was taking care if I was working with the same system all the time. So what I observed was only peaks expected. So like uh, no peaks, no cross peaks and uh, justifying the structure. Okay, what I did I'm not observing in the same monomer. I try to see the, the dimer formation, the dimerization. And I labeled like a leucine one and lysine uh, 23 to see the dimerization, the interface. And of course, I was keeping like a valiant tree that was really wonderful. Why? The reason for that is because I didn't observe any correlation between uh, leucine 1 and lysine 23, but I observed several cross peaks between uh, valine 3 and lysine 23. This is a really long range connectivity. This is really important for structure determination. That is quite interesting. So the structure proposed is a bit uh, wrong. What we did was uh, we started to to express the, the peptide in E. coli and uh, in order to use this approach. It was not possible to use uniformly labeled sample because of the, the repetition, but using this kind of approach was fine. And this was the spectrum that provided us uh, almost all assignments. And this is pretty nice, this is two glycerol sample. And of course, to, to improve our information concerning the system, we were using 20% uh, proton back exchange. This means like, uh, as I told you, the, the proton network is really strong because you have 99% of protons in our samples. And this is really bad in the way that I have a very strong dipolar dipolar coupling that will increase the, the line broadening for carbon. And to decrease that, I can use like a deuterium to decrease the amount of proton and increase the amount of deuterium in this case. And doing that, I can uh, acquire one TOBZ. TOBZ is a scalar coupling. It will depend on, on the sequence that you are using, but in principle, it's a, a scalar coupling uh, experiment. And it's like toxic. But I'm, I'm using not MLF 16 or 17, I'm using another kind of uh, sequence. And this is quite nice because it was possible to make the assignment. But only, in, in principle, you were expecting to see the flexible and the rigid part because when you are uh, decreasing the level of protons, uh, we would expect to have more information also concerning rigid parts. So in the way to see how ordered is our fibros, uh, we were like a following the line width. Line width is directly correlated to uh, the, the order of fibros. Why? Because if you have uh, disorder of fibros, probably you have more possibilities to the same amino acid and probably you have a, a, a broad peak. And in this case, we have line width really, really, really narrow. So this is comp the comparison to that is like a for uh, prion protein that were around 0.9 ppm. That is quite nice. So and the extension is like a from valine 3 up to lysine 23. This is the assignment that you, we have. But the problem is like uh, we know the assignment, but uh, we don't know if we are talking about intramolecular or intermolecular. We need to solve this problem because we have several connectivities, but we don't know if it belongs to the same strand or two strands. To solve that, we have the fourth labeling scheme. Now we are uh, thinking about a model. We, we had a model in our mind, and uh, so we labeled <laughs> specifically few amino acids to see if we were right. 
And so we have two different samples. This is a uh, uniformly labeled sample, only in that residues. And in this one, we have 20% of labeled sample and 80% of unlabeled sample. The reason for that is if I have uh, intra-residual connectivities and I make a dilution, I still have the connectivity. But if I have inter-residual connectivity, I can't observe anymore because I'm diluting. The chance is, is statistic. And so if I have like only 20% the chance to see another labeled residue, is really small. The tendency is decrease the intensity of the peak. So I was observing the connectivity between uh, serine 17 and glutamic acid 10 and vanished in this peak. So probably this interaction is intermolecular interaction. So now I know exactly what I'm talking about. And this, in reality, is a bit modified. Uh, what we have is this interaction here. And what we believe is that we have a triangle, like a prion protein, is that we have left-handed beta sheet. But uh, we needed to collect a bit more uh, information or make a collaboration with <laughs> Dr. Uh, Daniel Cox. To, to see if uh, we really have this possibility. We have several constraints, long range con constraints, to, to, to at least to suggest this kind of model, but uh, to be completely sure we needed to have additional information. So this is a little bit what we can do using solid state. Of course, um, if you're thinking about membrane proteins, one third of our genomes is membrane protein. So we have problems uh, to use crystallography and solution anymore. So solid state can solve this problem. Um, bless you. <laughs> so I'd like to say thanks to several collaborators from um, the uh, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Professora Débora Fugel, that is my collaborator in uh, TTR project. Dr. Gerson, that is my collaborator in several projects. It was my advisor during my, since I was pretty young. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Carolina Braga, professor that is uh, responsible for the microscopies. I used to follow all samples doing microscopy. And Ricardo Santana, this is my collaborator, is a PhD student from Deborah Fogel groups and he's working with MTTR2, it's really nice. My student, Flavia Guedes, that is engineer and chemistry engineer, and Juliana Santana, that is here, is physics. This is because we are trying to improve some pulse sequence in our lab, and this for, the reason for that is to, to, to multidisciplinary uh, environment. So I'd like to say thanks to Leibniz for molecular pharmacology, to Hart Muskinat. Every, I don't know, I used to go there every year, stay two or three months making experiments. I still in collaboration, strong collaboration with him. Uh, Anne Dill, that is responsible for the preparation of several samples. Bart van Hossen, that's physics, so is responsible for machines, not for the experiments, only when you have problems. And Dr. Trent Franks, uh, that is a, a pretty nice uh, researcher too, like Bart van Hossel, and they can uh, is, is belong to several projects too. And Freie Universität Berlin, uh, Beate Koch, that's a professor that is uh, collaborating with me and Hartmut in our R01 project. Uh, Enrico Brandenburg too. And in Sheffield University, uh, Rosemary Staniforth and Robert Parmore in the Stephen Beta uh, protein. That is quite interesting because it's not typical protein. It's like uh, the fibrosis is really interesting. And uh, Professor Carlos Ramos from Unicamp that is responsible for together Lisandra and Daniel to X-ray uh, crystallography. And of course, I'd like to thank Alexander von Humboldt for the stipendium that I received to go to Germany. 
and copies CNPQ for PERJ and UFRJ for the grants to make the research in my institute. And thanks for your attention. Question. <coughs> I, I'd like to know how you transfer the polarization from uh, the hydrogen to the carbon. Using cross polarization? Yes. So in principle, we are trying to match conditions. So first you have, if you're thinking about the external field, like uh, for instance, if you are working with a magneton with uh, 9.4 Tesla, that is like uh, 600 megahertz, um, you will have like a proton uh, precession frequency like 600 megahertz. The problem is like, uh, they are, imagine a person running in a really fast way, and another one is slowly. This one will never meet the another one because the another one is really fast. So you need to, to find a way that one can stay uh, on the side of each other and talk with each other. And this is what we are trying to do when we are applying spin lock. When we are applying spin lock, we are fixing the field now in another way. And this is, um, uh, I would say, uh, a temporary field only during uh, the, the time that you are applying the spin lock. And at this time, you will have the procession in, so like, uh, in this frequency. And this frequency, you put also the, the carbon so like a processing this frequency. And so now you have both of them walking in the same uh, speed, so they can contact with each other. And now you can transfer the magnetization to, to carbon. But only during this period, you can control this period. You can find the, the right uh, condition. This is what we call hart mahant condition. And of course, you observe like I didn't put anything, I just put like a bar, but you can have many things. You can have like a, a ramp. In general, I use ramp because you, you have some imperfections during the process and when you have a ramp, you can fulfill that. There are more or less five or six papers uh, suggesting different kind of ways to make these uh, Hartmann conditions. And you can choose one and use you can, use, uh, you can uh, change the amplitude of your, uh, or of your uh, pulse that you are applying. You can modulate that during the time. There are many ways. But in, in general, what you need to do is like to suit the, the, the speed to, to, to allow this contact between each other. In, in, a, in a very simple way to say. Of course, it's a bit more complicated. Hi, I got a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, was it a powder sample in e each of these experiments? You can it? use powders. Powder. You can, like, uh, in general, I use fibrils. I have these fibrils like a pellet. Uh -huh. And I can put the pellets. Of course, I, have, I still have water. But you can put a really powder inside the, the tube. Uh, OK. And then? Early on, you talked about the pulse sequence that you use to distinguish the intramolecular NOEs mm -hmm. versus intermolecular mm -hmm. NOEs. Um, so the specific pulse sequence you used, it distinguished between those? Or did you, it, what, did you have to confirm that with nosy and toxy type experiments? I can use, I, I can use nose. I, I have one sequence. I set one nosy to use. I have replaced the water gate to press it because when you are using some probes for solid state, you don't have gradient. I replaced uh, water gate, that is the way to make water suppression. I'm using like a press saturation. And I replaced during nosy, what you have is something like, uh, is something like, uh, a 90 degree pulse. And you have a mix in here. And what I did was to introduce here RFDR to make a recoupling. What I there is, when I finish, 
and I did my experiment. I was looking for in the literature. I saw it was published. And so you have several 180 pulse that is RFDR. You can like uh, make the recoupling really fast and you can get the, 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 the signal faster than an OZ because you have the dipolar coupling is one R3 and uh, nose is R6, so this is the reason. You can get faster your results. Correct, but so then did you have to use, you said you had to distinguish between inter and intramolecular. So yeah. After you used the RFDR, did you proceed to? But I'm not using this sequence for that. I'm okay. using um, NEHHC. I can use many of them, but I'm using this one. I have any HHC. That means that I have uh, the magnetization from proton to nitrogen. So I have a 92 degree pulse here. Here's proton. And I have come to nitrogen. Can you see? Here? To nitrogen. And I have transferring uh, to, to proton. So I can have another one here. And the problem in this sequence, I, I have several uh, cross polarization. I'm missing magnetization to the end. And I can have to proton to carbon. Now I have proton to carbon. And I can measure here. And uh, the approach is like, if I'm using uniform labeled sample, I cannot see like a difference between intra and intermolecular. But if I'm using one, like a part of my sample, labeled to nitrogen 15, and another one labeled to carbon 13, and I put, a, so like a one-one ratio. So now if I observe like interaction, a cross peak between nitrogen and carbon, I will be sure that I'm talking about intermolecular interaction. Uh, well, I think uh, we have, um, Gerson has uh, an important uh, announcement. Thank you so much, Monica. Wow. In fact, it's me and uh, Daniel. Well, I think uh, then Elisa will. F well, I think uh, I understand that we we are about to finish the session, but uh, before we finish, we f we saw that uh, it's time to say well, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank, thank you to Elisa. Um, come in, Elisa, uh, the white one, the white one for Elisa. The, 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 uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mariana, flowers, Mariana. Well, she's gonna complain. <laughs> yeah. Um. I, for, I forget the name of you, but Bruno, yeah, she did. <laughs> Not flowers, I love, although, I mean, I have received some flowers once. <laughs> and also to, <laughs> I forgot her name, <laughs> terrible names. Flora, Flora, flowers to Flora. <laughs> wow. I don't know if Daniel wants to add something. Well, none of, none of this could have happened without the intensive help of um, our crew here in Rio. And so uh, uh, I think we all owe them a standing ovation. And also to Daniel, because without Daniel,
So, Daniel is now the king of samba in, Sunday, in, uh, in California, okay, in Davis. I would like to thank all of you to be here. And uh, I just want to mention one point. I was very happy to see so many women. Because uh, besides working in science, I'm uh, very much concerned about uh, the participation of women in science. And that's a complaint I have with the web page of ICOM because there, <laughs> there is no label for gender, so we cannot count how many women have been participating, but I think it was quite a lot. And I'm uh, very happy. And I think the most important message I would like to leave for you, here what was important is to establish this uh, uh, collaboration, to meet the students from other countries, from other groups, and I, I hope you create some uh, kind of uh, uh, Facebook or something like that, yeah. and you make, <laughs> <laughs> and you can continue to exchange pictures and uh, experience, and maybe to start to heal some heal collaboration. Okay. We outsourced, uh, we outsourced the Facebook work to yeah. Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. now you, we should move. Now we should move to to the place where we will have this happy hour. And each one of you are going to get uh, four uh, vouchers for drinking. Oh. Yes. <laughs> it, it means, yes, it means uh, for soft drinks you need one voucher, but for cafeteria you need two. Ah, okay. okay? And then if you behave well, I can still distribute more at the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, once again, I also want to thank all the speakers, I, I know, and also the students. So let's. Thank the speakers and the students all together because the, the success was of you.